Matt's like rocking in the front row. Hey, good morning. How are we doing? Yeah, it's good to be in worship, right? It's good to be gathered together. It's good to see, good to see your faces. It's good to see some of your eyeballs. And uh, I'm thrilled you're here. Maybe you're, you're visiting. I met some visitors earlier this morning. And, and we love that you're visiting, whether you're in person here or maybe you're watching us online from somewhere in the world. Look, I, I have to give a shout out to our online community. You know change, do, do any of you just love change? Like when change, you're like, yes! No, I didn't think so. Well, um, you know, like an iPhone, for example, uh, it'll update. I don't ask it to, it just does, and then I'm sad it did, because now I have to learn a new operating system. Well, we have a new online platform that is being used. So if you, if you watch on YouTube, you didn't notice anything. Everything's normal there. However, if you typically go to Facebook on Sunday mornings, you're gonna notice that Facebook, we're moving you towards this new online platform. Don't resist it, like embrace it. We're really excited about this new platform for a lot of reasons. One, this is just nerdy pastor talking. Like there's actually, while you watch, there is a, a link that you can click on inside this platform where you can pull up the scripture. You can actually read the scripture as we're teaching the scripture. Like, I love that. There's a note column where you can pull up and you can take notes, and, and I love that. But, but here's the thing that, that really gets us excited is it allows our moderators who are doing the online chat while people are joining us from all over the world, kind of allows them to engage with those who are watching online a little better. And there is a, a feature that towards the end of the message, you can actually, you can put out an invitation online that, that says, hey, if you just sensed God stirring something in your life, and, and if you've never given your life to Jesus before, if, if you feel like today's the day and you wanna make that decision to follow Jesus, to let him be your Lord and personal savior, you, you, can, like, you can hit a little button. And last week, we had six people give their lives to Jesus during the course of the message. That's something to clap about and celebrate about. And here's... Here's the even better news, it wasn't bots. Like they were real people and we've been in touch with them and I just, I love that's what, that's what we're about, right? I don't, I don't ever wanna lose that. I don't ever wanna just fall victim to think that I'm just, I'm, I'm talking to people that understand the Christian language, that there are people that, that are with us. Look, Jesus, uh, before he ever gave the great commission to his disciples and said go and make disciples of all nations. He gave a great invitation. It always started with this, come and follow me. And may we, um, as your leaders in this church, and may all of us, may we never forget that we are to be a people who are about giving others the great invitation to follow Jesus. So that's just exciting, and I wanted to share that with you. All right, if you have your Bibles, forged the art of formation. We are in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And here's, here's where I wanna go today. We're, we're in Daniel chapter two. Now, a little fact about Daniel chapter two. It is the longest chapter that you find in the book of Daniel. And of course, I'm gonna preach it in 25 minutes. So this morning, um, chapter two brought to you by two things. Number one, the power of the Holy Spirit. And number two, um, your pastor who has ADHD. And Susan added, not necessarily in that order. I wanna talk about chaos. I wanna talk about crisis, and I, I wanna talk about kingdoms, because you find these three things in Daniel chapter two, chaos. What do you do when you live in the midst of a world that just seems to be spiraling out of control? Crisis. What do you do when that world that seems to be spiraling out of control, what do you do when it meets you, when it, when it knocks on your door and you are faced with a crisis in your life and what is a kingdom that you can pledge your allegiance to that is never going to fail you? Believe it or not, those three things, all of them in Daniel chapter two. I'm so excited to bring this word today. I love what God is saying personally to me within the context of it and to all of us. So will you join me in a quick word of prayer before we, before we dive in this morning? Gracious and loving God, um, just that, just that lyric, I was just savoring that lyric that Brenna was leading before I came out. I will sing because I trust you. <laughs> Lord, that, that, that comes out so easy, but Father, we know that, that there are difficulties. And, and, and I know as I, as I come out, as I share this word of hope and encouragement that, Father, I see, I see faces that are in front of me, but I also know that there are, are people watching from all over. And 
God, I, I, I know some hearts that are in front of me, but I don't know all of them. But, but here's the comfort that I have this morning. And, and truly, something that I've held on to is that, God, you are not a God who is surprised by anything. Nothing catches you off guard. And Lord, I believe you are at work in this world. So whether someone finds themselves in the category of chaos or they find themselves in the category of crisis or Lord, they find themselves just disappointed in the kingdoms of this earth, I pray, Holy Spirit, that there would just be something supernatural that would happen this morning. Father, we, um, we can't come in and brush up against the divine and leave as we entered into the space or as we logged on from wherever we're watching. So. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would now just orchestrate this time. Speak through me, Father. Through me, if not in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard, and it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. And God's people said, amen and amen. So uh, it was a couple of weeks ago before the doors opened back up, before your sweet faces came back in, that uh, it was that kind of weird six-month season where I became a televangelist. I didn't ask for it, but it just happened. And I was sitting over here, and I was getting ready to come up on the stage to, to preach. And the bands, typically, um, before everybody came in, we all kind of like gathered in this section over here. And I have about 25 to 30 seconds to get out here, to, to put everything on the table, so I don't have a whole lot of time. But when that bumper, when that kind of music thing that you just saw, when that was rolling, I was walking up on the stage, and when I did, I walked by uh, Ben Bullock's chair. Now, now Ben, one of our band members, you, you see him. Ben's right over here. He's one of our electric players. And Ben, by the way, is married to Brenna. Brenna's his sweet life, wife, and we love Brenna. And I was walking by his chair, and I noticed that he had a can, there was a drink that was sitting by his stuff, and as I was walking up, I looked, and the, I saw the label, it said, liquid death. <laughs> and, I, and I, like, that intrigued me, and I walked up on the stage, and I went, bro, are you drinking liquid death? He's like, yeah. So I came up, and, you know, before the lights went up, before I started giving the message, I had two initial thoughts. Number one, that's exactly what I want my electric guitar player to be drinking, liquid death. Like that made perfect sense. But, but thought number two, and this is my age, thought number two was this, well, there's probably no way I could drink liquid death and like sleep tonight, you know? Because I don't know, like I, I think I'm beyond the ages to be drinking liquid death in my mind. Like I'm thinking there's four different kinds of Red Bull in there and like the bottom third is coffee grounds. You drink the top and you chew the bottom. Like, I, like my, my mind, that's kind of what I created out of this can. So a couple days pass and I don't say anything else, but then I see Brenna in a worship meeting. And I said, Brenna, I have to ask you, like, I'm so intrigued by your husband drinking liquid death. Like, what is this drink? Like, how does he sleep at night? Like, what is that? Doesn't that, like, charge his heart? And she looked at me and she said, are, are you kidding? And I went, no, I'm, I'm serious. And she goes, do, do you not know? And I went, what? She said, it's carbonated water. <laughs> was it, we, what? She said, yeah, it's carbonated water. It's just a marketing thing. Like, like the byline is, to quench a killer thirst, liquid death. It's just like Topo Chico <laughs> inside a black can with the melting skull on it. And wow, Ben's not as cool as I thought he was. Good to know. So here's why, here's why I'm sharing that. I mean, I wonder, have we, ever, have we ever done that in our lives? Think about this for a moment. Like, have we, have we ever... Have we ever been presented with like a can of liquid death? Has, has culture ever presented, like that's chaos to me. Where you just think everything that's spiraling around you is, is out of control and, and all the sirens are going off and it's like warning, warning, warning. But do we actually run away when we need to stop and remember that God is at work in the can of chaos in our lives? And that's, to me, that's Daniel. To me, that's what we're learning, as right now we're just in Daniel chapter two, because the beginning of the chapter, you find there is a can of liquid death that is about to be handed to Daniel, only he doesn't know it yet. So let me, let me kind of paraphrase a little bit with, with chapter two and, and catch you up to speed. In the beginning of chapter two, you're introduced to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we talked about King Nebuchadnezzar last week. 
We talked about kind of his style, the way that he ran the kingdom and, and, and how all of that worked. But today in chapter two, we meet him and we meet him on the other side of having a really bad dream and it bothered him. It kept him awake to the point that he actually called his wise men. Now, his wise men were his magicians, his sorcerers. He called them in and he said, here's what I need you to do for me, guys. Two things. I need you to tell me what it was that I dreamed. And number two, I want you to interpret this dream for me. Now, I wrote in the margin of my Bible, Okay, that's just crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. What should have happened was, I mean, he should have said, look, here's the dream that I had and interpret it. But he did something completely different. Why? We don't really know. I think he was just like, you jokers are overpaid as it is. I wanna make sure I'm getting my money's worth. It's the equivalent of you going into the doctor, don't try this, and say, hey, doc. And he's like, hey, what can I do for you? Say, uh, how about you do this for me? Why don't you tell me what my problem is and then tell me how you're gonna cure it? I don't think that's gonna go well for you. So they, they go back and forth, the sorcerers, the magicians. When you read it, it's really kind of funny because they try and, and, and stall and, and Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, well, I'll give you some incentive. If you don't do this thing I'm telling you to do, I'm gonna cut you up into tiny pieces and burn your homes. Now, I don't know how motivation works for you. I don't think that pressure really worked well. It kind of freaked them out more. And ultimately, here's where it landed. And, and I love this. Because I think this is the tension of Daniel that we feel, and I love it. Ultimately, it landed with the magicians and the sorcerers saying to Nebuchadnezzar, look, king, here's the thing. What you are asking us to do is impossible. No one can do this. Only the gods can do this. And here's the thing. The gods do not dwell on earth with the people the gods are in heaven and they're looking down. Now here's the pull, and this is what I love. Remember, it is possible to live in Babylon and not compromise who you are, right? That's what we talked about last week. And I love the tension there is this, this Babylonian concept that the gods were distant from, from the people. However, what we find time and time and time again in Daniel is God is not a distant God from his people. Praise God. I mean, God is not at a six-foot distance because he's afraid he's gonna get cooties from us. That's, that's not Yahweh, that's not who God is. Like, God dwells with his people. But Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't like what he's hearing because he's not getting the answer that he wants. So what happens? Read along, Daniel chapter two, starting in verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all of the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Why? Because if you remember last week it ended that Daniel and his friends, you, you may know them by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they had actually, God had granted them favor and wisdom, and they were 10 times smarter than the rest of all of the magicians and the sorcerers. Somehow, they missed the invitation. So when the king orders this edict, this means that Daniel and his friends, believers in Yahweh, transformers, not conformers, remember, that they were about to be killed. So verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and with tact. Don't we need men and women of God who still speak (laughs) with wisdom, the wisdom that God has given, and tact? And he asked the king's officer, hey, why did the king issue such a harsh degree? And Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. Verse 16, at this, Daniel went into the king and he asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Remember, God is working behind the scenes. Daniel had this position of prominence where he could walk into the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar, stand in front of the most powerful man in the Babylonian kingdom and say, listen, um, Daniel, hi, I know you remember me. Um, So I'm a worshiper of Yahweh. You remember the, uh, 
God who dwells among his people. Listen, I, um, I, want, to, I want to let you know, if you'll give me a little time, I, I heard about the pickle that you're in, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna figure this out for you, right? This is what he does. Now, here's crisis. We've seen chaos. Now chaos is turning into crisis in the life of Daniel and his friends. How you respond in the face of, of crisis makes all the difference in the world. So I want you to think, all right, how does he respond to the face of crisis that he's just been presented with? Here it is, verse 17. Then Daniel returned to his house, and he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. What does he do in the face of crisis? He doesn't panic, he prays. What does he do? Everything, I mean this is the moment, right? Red alert, hit the panic button. Like it's the time to run, we're all gonna die. He doesn't panic, he calls a prayer meeting. <laughs> I mean how simple is this? How easy of a reminder, but how necessary. We forget that prayer is a powerful weapon in the face of crisis that we experience in our lives. This reminds us that we as a people, we are called to be faithful in prayer. Now look, we have Matthew 7, 7, right, where Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. But they didn't have that, but they did have the Psalms. I wonder if the first place that Daniel went to was, was Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, and he is faithful in all that he does. He is faithful. Someone, right now, you need to remember that God is faithful. He is faithful in all of his ways. I love that. 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, and he fulfills the desires of those who fear him, and he hears their cries, the cries of those who say, Lord, save me. They don't fall on deaf ears. God is on watch. Be faithful in prayer. Or how about Proverbs chapter three, five, and six? These are two of my favorites. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your, with all of your heart, not a quarter or a third, but you lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him, and what will he do? He will make your paths straight time and time again. He didn't panic, he prayed. And by the way, this is important too. He didn't pray alone. It's easy to forget this part. We can't rush past this because it's important to understand not only did he drop to his knees and pray, was he faithful in prayer, but he called a prayer gathering with people. You know, it's easy to, I like look and I see Daniel and I, and I go personally for me, I wanna have the, I wanna have the courage of Daniel. Or, or I wanna have the, the fortitude of Esther or, or I wanna have the strength of King David. Oh, we, we can't forget that, that Esther, Esther had Mordecai. She had someone that she could go to that says, listen, you need to join me. You need to tell the, the people, my people, that we need to gather and we need to pray for a breakthrough. Esther couldn't carry it on her own. It was too big. David, David didn't have it by himself. David had a group of men around him. They were known as his mighty men. There were people that could lean into him, people that he could pray alongside. Daniel knew too big for just him, so he goes to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Even Jesus, in unquestionably the darkest night of the soul, when he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of his betrayal, this gives me great comfort. Jesus brought his disciples with him, but there were three, Peter, James, and John, who actually he took deeper with him into the garden, and he said, I need you, I need you guys to pray over me. I need you to stand guard over me while I pray because this is just too big for me to carry on my own. We need to be faithful in prayer. Who's your Mordecai? Who's your mighty men? Who are your mighty women? 
Who's your Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Think about that. Fire up a flare. You're not weak if you actually reveal to someone, hey, I'm struggling, and I can't do this on my own. Now, I would be remiss to not add a second part to this, and this is important. We don't always talk about this. This is like, you know, when you're watching the, the car commercial, and at the end of the car commercial, it ends with, it's over. You're like, I don't know what just happened, right? The voice that talks really fast. You gotta be faithful in prayer. Here it is. You also need to be patient in the waiting. You need to be patient in the waiting. Full transparency, there are things that I have been pounding on the door of heaven. There have been prayers and breakthroughs that I've been saying, God, I need to see an intervention here. And I've been praying those prayers for years. Be fervent in your prayers, but be patient in the waiting. I think about, I think about Isaiah chapter 40. I love this verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not be faint. You're like, yeah, all that Old Testament stuff. What about the New Testament? I'm so glad you pushed me on that. Romans chapter 8, verse 25. The apostle Paul says this. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Be faithful in your prayers in the face of crisis. Be patient in the waiting. Praise him in the breakthrough. What I love about Daniel's story, I mean, we want the God of Amazon Prime that will answer the prayer right away and and it's always great when he does, sometimes he doesn't. But in Daniel's case, in chapter two, Daniel was clearly on a deadline. There, there was an execution that was coming and God's faithful. And Daniel goes to sleep and God gives him both the dream and the interpretation. Now don't miss this, if you're a note taker, remember there's chaos. And then it gets close and there's crisis. And then there's the prayer. And then comes the blessing. Here's the blessing. What happens on the other side of the blessing? There's praise. I just love, before Daniel runs to Nebuchadnezzar and says, hey, here's what's going on, he stops, he takes a breath, and he just says, thank you, Father. There's a sweep because of time. I don't have the time to read it, but just read it in Daniel chapter two. There's a sweet song of praise that he just gives back to the Lord. And then he goes before Nebuchadnezzar. And he comes before him. Here's kind, of, here's kind of how it ends. He goes before Nebi. At this point, I'm just gonna call him Nebi. Nebuchadnezzar, it takes too much time, so I need to start getting shorter here. So he goes before Nebi, and he says, Nebi, here's, here's, the, here's the deal. I want you to know that God, Yahweh, the God who dwells among his people, the God that I worship, that God has heard your cries and God is gracious. So God is the one who's gonna get the glory for what I am about to tell you. How important. Daniel didn't like say this is all about me. He says you need to know God's the one who's gonna get the glory here. And here's the dream that you had. You dreamed that there was a statue made in the image of man. It was a tall statue. And at the head of the statue, it was made in pure gold. And the shoulders and the breast were made of silver. And the waist and the thighs were made of bronze. And the feet of this statue were made of a combination of Iron and clay. Now, there was a rock that came from the sky. It was unlike anything that you had ever seen before. And this rock would smash into the statue and it would smash it at its feet where, pay attention, the iron and the clay were together. That's actually its weakest spot. And what happened? The gold was 10 times heavier than what was down here than the iron. So the gold actually crumbled. The silver gave way. The bronze fell. All of the statue completely collapsed. And the wind came. And like chaff, it was blown away. And this rock that smashed into the statue 
actually grew and it turned into a great mountain and it covered the entire earth. Now, if you're Nebi at this moment, you're gonna be like, you get a gold sticker. There are so many details there. Now, what on earth does that mean? And Daniel gives the interpretation. Again, because of time, you can read this, it's incredible. Daniel says, hey, Nebi, here's what's going on. God, God is actually giving you a future prophecy of all of the kingdoms that are about to come. He said the gold head, the ornate gold, that Nebuchadnezzar, God is saying, this is your Babylonian rule. This is your Babylonian kingdom. But what you need to prepare yourself for is your kingdom will eventually fall. Silver, another kingdom will come in. It will fall. Bronze, another kingdom will come in. It will fall. Iron, believed to be the Roman Empire, the Roman kingdom, it will come in. But because it is intertwined with, with clay, why is clay important? When you go back into Genesis chapter two, it's just so fascinating to me. What, is God, what does God make mankind in? He scoops up the Adama, it is the, the clay, mankind. And in this Roman civilization, <laughs> where you have a kingdom, but it is meshed with human beings, it's always gonna be flawed, it's always gonna be weak, because that's just who we are. But there is a rock, I would say a cornerstone, that is coming in around that Roman Empire time, and it is going to shatter the kingdoms of man. And what is that rock, here's, here's what Daniel says. Daniel chapter two, verses 44 and 45. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all of those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. And this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown you, the king, what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy that Jesus is coming in, that he will establish his kingdom, and it's gonna change the world forever. And here's the thing, we stand between two worlds. We stand between two kingdoms. Like, do you realize, we're in Daniel chapter two. Like, we stand between the now and the not yet. The now is the kingdom that we are in the midst of where we realize that there are authorities, there are rulers, and yes, we subject to the authorities and the rulers of our kingdom, but we know that this kingdom is flawed because we're a part of it. The not yet is the new kingdom, Jesus who is stepping into the world. So what does this mean? Three things real quickly. Number one, I would say this, that history, we're reminded, history really is his story. I hope this gives you hope that even in the midst of all of the mess, Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. History, it really is his story. Number two, man-made kingdoms will fall. That's just a gimme. But Christ's kingdom is eternal, that's never gonna change. I love the way Warren Wiersbe, a commentator, put it. By the way, you know if it makes a note card with like comic book writing, you know this is something I'm gonna hold on to. He said, while God's people should do everything they can do to alleviate suffering and make this a safer and a happier world, our hope, it's not in laws, our hope really isn't in political parties. Our hope is not in moral crusades. Our hope is in Jesus. People's hearts, they need to be changed by the grace of God. And that means that God's people must be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. What is Christ's kingdom? 
You know when the rock came into the world? I think it started coming into the atmosphere hot in Luke chapter four when Jesus announced, I'm the Messiah, I'm here. I think the rock came into the atmosphere when he unrolled that scroll and he said this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The good news is the kingdom of Christ is eternal. He is building this. It is happening, and he calls us to put everything we have into standing on this foundation and building this kingdom that he is setting up until the trumpet sounds and Christ comes again. Lastly, don't forget, he's coming again. It's not a threat. Jesus, that was the thing that just confused people. When they were looking for the Messiah, they were looking for someone who would rule with oppression, and power, with an iron fist, right? No, Jesus ruled with compassion and love. So friends, I, I don't know, I don't know where you are today. Maybe the chaos has you overwhelmed. It's okay. God is at work in the can of liquid death that maybe you're staring down right now. <laughs> maybe the crisis is tearing you apart and you're just so worried and you're not sleeping at night. Be faithful in prayer. Be patient in the waiting. And maybe you're just hopeless today because you're just looking around saying, God, I just don't know where you are. No, his kingdom is here. He calls us to build it. So will you stand? I wanna pray over you right now. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for these words. Father, I thank you. They're just a, Lord, this has just been a balm on my heart this week. You've just met me with such compassion and, and grace, but yet in the midst of it, there's such conviction. So Lord, I just pray that wherever my friends are, they would sense that, that God, you're working and you're there. But Lord, I know there may be someone this morning, maybe someone who's been going through the motions of church, the motions of Jesus for far too long, but they've never literally stopped and just said, God, I invite you in. They've never just stopped. Someone right now, you're weary, you're tired, you've been carrying the weight of the world, and Jesus is saying, come to me, are you weary and heavy laden? I'll give you rest. Maybe today's that day, it's your spiritual birthday, today's the day that you wanna just give your life to Jesus, and if, you, if you're there, it's as simple as just saying these words, Jesus, I invite you in. I recognize that there is sin in my life, but greater, Father, the cross, takes away that sin. Your love, your compassion washes me clean. So Jesus, be Lord of my life. And if you prayed that prayer, praise God. Tell someone. Let someone know what God is doing in your life. Father, for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you have in store, we trust you. And we're going to sing until the breakthrough.